All right, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. If you're just joining us now, welcome. Excited to be with you all. We have for our second session today of our Decoding Dementia Gathering, Dr. Jennifer Carson and Jen Wilson, which I'll introduce with uh, more, <laughs> I'll introduce more in just a few minutes before, after I go through the quick announcements. This is one of my favorite events of the year. It's our gathering. It's a third Decoding Dementia Gathering where we explore all innovation, new ideas that we'd love you to consider when it comes to dementia and people living with cognitive change. As a reminder, Activity Strong is this platform that was created to acknowledge, empower, and educate activities and life enrichment in senior living, but also help elevate what we consider to be essential in our industry because it ultimately leads to person-directed living and quality of life for everyone, especially when you have cognitive change. As a quick announcement and exciting announcements, if you know, were not aware, Link Senior was recently acquired and merged into this amazing organization called Life Loop. Me and the rest of my team are very excited to continue uh, on. We have a lot of exciting new projects and work. And so I'm excited for the future of senior living as we embark on this new chapter. I also wanna share the fact that going back to Activity Strong, we started this platform with NAP, NCAP, and Activity Connection, who remain strong partners in this initiative. Myself, I am now the general manager, Link Senior, with Life Loop. And, um, you know, I like to say that, quote unquote, old people are cool, which is an initiative that we started a few years ago, because, yes, everyone's cool, including older people, and obviously, Activity Strong. I have this deep belief, which is obviously shared with our speakers today, that there would be no senior living without activities and life enrichment and how we engage people so they find purpose every day. Just as a quick reminder, in terms of CEUs, we can earn up to three NAB, NCAP, NCTRC, and or NCCDPC credits. Uh, to earn them, you need to be in one or up to three sessions. We'll ask that you fill in the survey either in the chat or the one that you get by email, which is the same, but by the end of the day on Friday, September 6th, and then we will send them by email to you throughout the course of next week. So between Monday and Friday, given the high volume, you know, it might take a few days to go through them. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us at webinars with an S at linksenior.com. As a reminder, this session is recorded, so you'll be able to use the recording afterwards to share with your future self if you loved it, and I'm sure you will, uh, but obviously your friends and family and anyone within your organization. Given the size of the audience, we highly recommend you use both the chat and the Q&A. If you use the chat, make sure you select everyone so that everyone can see your valuable contribution. And then the Q&A is more directed to our speakers. We already had tons of great questions the first session, and I'm sure we'll get some in the second session today but this makes it easier for us and the panelists and the speakers, sorry, to uh, view your questions and your meaningful contribution. And then last but not least, my personal favorite one is please have fun. You know, learning is better when we have fun. Just know that our speakers today um, are here to help you elevate what you do every day and hopefully, and I'm sure we all will learn something. So, I think that Dr. Jennifer Carson, who was on our first session, needs no introduction, but I'll just share the fact that she is, for me personally, one of my kind of critical guiding star when it comes to the dementia world, of given what she's done for the industry and for this particular uh, topic. And um, Jen and I had the pleasure of starting to write, interact, I think, earlier this year, and I was amazed by what you do, Jen, at Carol Woods. So Jen Wilson is the Vice President of Wellbeing at Carol Woods Retirement Community. I'm excited for uh, to hear what you have to share and I'll let you start sharing your screen here and we'll go off camera now. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Hi, Jen, it's good to see you. <laughs> Great one, we're glad to be here. All right, go team Jen, right? <laughs> go team Jen. So so welcome back, everyone. Um, this is session number two, and uh, I am. Um, oh, there. Sorry about that. Sorry. Let me just uh, move 
all of you so I can see you and my slides. There we go. The wonder of technology. All right. Welcome back. For those of you who uh, maybe didn't uh, join us for the first session, and we're kind of picking up the conversation where we left off, we'll back up just a hair, though, to let you all know a little bit about what you missed. Um, but I'm Jennifer. I'm happy to be here with my dear friend and colleague, Jen Wilson, Team Jen. And uh, I'm an associate professor in the School of Public Health at UNR, director of the DEER program, Dementia Engagement Education Research Program, also in the School of Public Health at UNR. Um, I'm a gerontologist, uh, but like I was sharing in session one, uh, I have a very long background as an activities professional and uh, did work for many years as a certified therapeutic recreation specialist. And so I'm super happy to be among my tribe. Um, it's great interacting with you all, um, and thank you for being here. Jen, anything you want to say just to introduce yourself before we get rolling? Same. Thank you. Um, I'm just really excited to be here with all of you. My um, my role at Carol Woods, which is in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, is one of supporting the team that um, supports residents across the continuum of support. Um, so we have primary care, assisted living, skilled nursing, rehab, um, things that I'm sure plenty of you are involved in on a daily basis as well. Carol Woods is also a dementia inclusive community. And so it's really fun for me um, to be able to interact with folks who are also providing dementia inclusive care or who are interested in um, pursuing it and really to have some um, conversation as much as we can in this kind of forum, but to have some conversation about it and, and elevate this discussion. So I'm appreciative to Life Loop too for offering us this opportunity. So glad to be here. Yeah, thanks Life Loop and thanks Jen. And uh, we will absolutely be using that chat box. So hopefully um, you're all ready for that. In the last hour, the first session of this gathering, um, Kirsten and I engaged everyone with five arguments um, that really set the stage for um, why so many of us believe that inclusive dementia care and support uh, really should be the, the gold standard. And so in the last hour, we explored the civil rights, human rights argument. We explored the fact that the research is showing us that the locked doors itself are one of the primary causes of distress among residents who are living with dementia. Um, we talked about the fallacy of homogeneity. That's this um, harebrained idea that, um, you know, despite the diversity of people living with dementia, there's just one approach that could possibly meet all of their needs. That's what I mean by harebrained. And we kind of unpacked why that just doesn't make sense. You know, um, <laughs> there's so much diversity in the experience of living with dementia. Surely there's not a one size fits all approach here. Uh, we talked about the fact that there's really no compelling evidence base for superior outcomes uh, with locked and segregated memory care. We looked at systematic reviews of decades of literature, and all we can really say is, at best, it's a mixed bag. Um, and then we talked about the demographic argument, that we can't meet the needs of the growing number of people living with dementia in the United States um, by just building more you know, sticks and mortar buildings um, <laughs> called memory care. So, um, so we talked about these arguments and we engaged with these arguments and asked all of you your thoughts on these arguments and how do they align with your own observations and experiences and really enjoyed the discussion. Um, I did mention that Dr. Al Power and Pat Sprigg, former CEO of Carol Woods and I are writing a book about the case for inclusive living in these positive pathways for inclusion, which Jen and I are going to be sharing with you. Um, and, the, and, and as we talk about this, know that these six positive and practical pathways to providing integrated and inclusive dementia care and support to a very great extent are based on the research that I had the honor of conducting in partnership with Jen and Pat at Carol Woods in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Um, I'm a participatory action researcher, and we'll talk in, towards the end a little bit more about how you know we leveraged research to really help strengthen the approach um, that Carol Woods uses to support the inclusion of people living with dementia. So we're going to talk about these pathways and how you know ideas for implementing these pathways. Jen's going to get real practical and sharing 
how Carol Woods implements these pathways. Um, and she's also going to share some of the challenges and solutions encountered. So that's our uh, flight plan. Uh, we are building inclusive communities. Uh, Jen and I just want to take a moment to thank our learning partners, our teachers, Dr. Al Power, Pat Sprigg, and yeah, Kirsten Jacobs, who was just awesome in the last session from Leading Age. So um, thank you so much to um, these three fabulous values-driven professionals and thought leaders for um, sharing their wisdom with us. And uh, a lot of their wisdom is in this presentation as well. So these are the six positive pathways to dementia inclusion that Jen and I are eager to engage you with. For each one of these, we're going to you know, share some content and we're going to have a couple of reflection questions for all of you so that we can hear your ideas and perspectives as well. We're going to talk about reframing dementia, our need to focus on well-being, proactively instead of treating ill being. We're going to talk about the fact that there ain't no one size fits all in this business. Uh, no model that, you know, is going to meet the needs of all people who are living with dementia because dementia supports complex. We're going to talk about risk, um, both upside and downside risk and how to negotiate it. We're going to talk about how to shape the physical and social environments to be dementia inclusive. And then finally, look at the role that technology can play, not like big brother technology, but respectful technology, non-invasive technology can play in really supporting the rights, the autonomy, the freedom, the self-determination of people who are living with dementia. So these are the six pathways. Can't wait to share them with you. And we're going to start with this one. Uh, this is um, pathway number one, reframing dementia. And yeah, it really does uh, start here. Um, the way that we think about dementia, you know, our mindset, uh, the words we use to describe dementia, the meanings we attach to the actions of people living with dementia, that all shapes our actions as care and support partners toward people who are living with dementia. And the accumulation of our actions individually and collectively over time, to a very great extent, shape the experience of living with dementia. Okay, so what we're going to talk about with reframing is not just about semantics, but the power our words and thoughts have in shaping the lived experience of dementia in residential care settings. So as we reframe dementia, I like starting here. Um, this is a, a table I use often in my teaching that presents two different views of dementia, the biomedical view and the social relational view. Now, I was formally taught you know, to really view dementia as tragic, progressive, and fatal. And as a therapeutic recreation specialist, I was trained to intervene right, with my therapy um, to do discrete programs for discrete outcomes. Um, caregivers in the biomedical view tend to be considered the experts and they therefore oftentimes make decisions for people living with dementia. And I was trained, I don't know about all of you, but I was definitely trained to see um, something called, you know, behavioral symptoms of dementia, and um, I actually helped write practice protocols for the treatment of disturbing behaviors earlier in my career. And the idea is that we're intervening with these interventions um, to help cope with all of these so-called dementia behaviors. And as a therapeutic recreation specialist, then I was taught that my activities should be structured and stage specific and failure free, et cetera, and that people living with dementia are fading away. People living with dementia, though, have taught me another perspective on um, people living with dementia and some colleagues in the field um, who have also learned from people living with dementia see dementia very differently. Instead of tragic, progressive and fatal, not to dispute that it is, um, but can you imagine living with a tragic, progressive and fatal condition for 10 years, 15 years? 20 years. <laughs> so instead, from a social perspective, how about thinking of dementia as a shift in a person's perception and experience of the world? And instead of focusing on interventions, what if we got upstream and focused on supporting well-being 
Instead of making decisions for people living with dementia, what if we view ourselves as care partners who open spaces for decisions with? Instead of seeing behaviors as problems to be managed, what if we learn to see those so-called behaviors as communication, oftentimes of an unmet need or of distress? Instead of activities being structured, stage-specific, and failure-free, what if we all embraced the truth that leisure is a fundamental human right and that people living with dementia have a right to leisure? And instead of viewing people living with dementia as fading away into nothingness, the long goodbye, what if we saw people living with dementia as fully alive and continuing to grow? So I want to dig down onto just one of these examples a little bit more. This notion of shifting or reframing so-called behaviors or BPSDs, behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia. A wonderful person living with dementia, a self-advocate who's written some great books about her experience, Christine Bryden says, look, professionals, you can keep your crappy acronym if you love it so much, BPSD. Let me tell you what's really going on here. Basic personal signs of distress. I'm telling you, something ain't going well. Instead of treating me with interventions or blaming it on the pathology of dementia, help look for the underlying cause and then let's avoid it. Dr. Al Power actually calls it BPSOD for the over medicalization of dementia. And that's what happens when we only see dementia through the lens of the biomedical perspective and not also the social relational. The truth is, folks, I think of those two lenses like my two eyeballs, and I navigate the world best when both of my eyes are open. But a lot of bad things can come from a biomedical only view of dementia, hence Dr. Al Power's acronym BPSOD. And so um, I just want to, uh, uh, Jen, I think I'm going to just allude to this. If um, you want to watch a very entertaining video, uh, if you Google BAN, B-A-N, B-P-S-Ds, um, there is a really wonderful song here performed by Dr. Al Power um, about the danger and the overuse of this kind of behavioral labeling of what for many people are expressions of stress and distress. Um, and we know, we all know that there's a lot of reasons why a person might be in distress. You know, having a diagnosis of dementia is difficult. Feeling like care partners are taking over where you can and still make decisions and want to make decisions, um, that causes distress. Having people talk over you instead of to you causes distress. Having a hard time processing information can cause distress. Having unmet needs causes distress, right? Having a lack of orientation can cause distress. Having too much or too little stimulation can cause, all oh, these are just a short list of possible causes of distress. And you know what else can cause distress as we heard about in session number one is when people perceive a threat to their personhood, to their autonomy and to their freedom. When people feel locked in, what we heard about the research about how locked doors are a primary cause of distress, locked doors cause distress, right? So instead of labeling it behaviors, Let's get curious and say, is there an unmet need here or a cause of distress? Okay, that's a really important reframe. All right, Jen. All right. So we're going to now talk about well-being, which is one of my favorite words and concepts. And I feel fortunate to even have it as part of my job title. Um, well-being is something that we as humans all want to have in our days, right? We all want more well-being and less distress. And often, you know, there's an entire industry devoted to how we can support well-being as we go through our days. Um, interestingly, once a person is living with dementia, um, the emphasis can go to treating the disease rather than continuing to promote that sense of well-being. We may not completely put it aside, but that diagnosis and treating it becomes more, um, seems to become higher on the list. And Jennifer was talking about that in terms of reframing as well. When we think about focusing on well being, we then can kind of track towards a truly person centered approach, one that is individualized 
and one that also focuses on the whole person and really helps us to, um, as we like to say at Carol Woods, get upstream and really try to get to what the source of a person's expression of need or expression of distress due to the environment is coming from. Um, it gives us an opportunity to be proactive. It gives us also an opportunity just to relate to our residents living with dementia from a place of shared humanity. Um, you'll see an image there on the slide of Al Power's book, Dementia Beyond Disease, which is a tremendous resource and talks through what is meant by well-being and a framework that we'll look at in a minute. Um, but it also talks about um, it talks about just the shared um, the shared experience we all have with well-being. And I will say that when we had some residents at Carol Woods read this book along with staff, we finished the book and they said, this is for everyone. This isn't just for people living with dementia. And so we can all relate to one another in terms of wanting to achieve this sense of well-being. So as we talk about taking this focus um, of trying to um, trying to take a person-centered approach and um, look at well-being, we might ask ourselves, how do we define it? And there's a framework that um, comes from the Eden Alternative and is also mentioned in Dementia Beyond Disease um, that suggests seven different categories or domains that make up a person's well-being. Um, and they're here in this triangle format um, to show how they connect and build on one another. Um, in the next slide, we'll see another version of what well being can look like, also seven different domains. Um, and these are completely in alignment with those on the prior slide. What's different about, different about these is that they were developed with people living with dementia and really by people living with dementia. Um, you might see Jennifer's last name there in the bottom because she was involved in this participatory action um, effort to really define what well being means from the perspective of the person living with dementia. Um, I love this image too because it shows how all of these domains really flow into one another um, and overlap. And I think that's really part of the human experience with them. It can be helpful to think about well being and these domains within well being as cups um, and how we can fill a person's cups of well being. Um, so you think about, you know, think about coming in to work in the morning with a cup full of water to help myself stay hydrated. As I go through the day, I might take sips from it and need to refill in order to keep that cup full. Just like we come in with a cup of emotional energy that we as staff use to support residents living with dementia and residents generally living in our communities, we're pouring into other people's cups through the day to help to fill those. We also need to fill our cups as well. Um, and we, I talk about this concept in this way because it helps us to relate to it ourselves um, and then to think about the importance of filling um, cups of well-being among residents through the day as well. Um, so I'd like to pause for a minute and think about these cups or these glasses together um, and ask you to enter into the chat, which glass do you think is the hardest to fill for a person living with dementia and why? And we'll take a look at those together. There's seven of them here. And um, I'll tell you to get started. I think that one that is hard um, is growing and developing because we often don't think of people living with dementia as being capable of learning or growing, trying new things, et cetera, which is part of that. Um, and also because just the nature of the day in long-term care and senior living, sometimes it's hard for us as staff too to support residents in making a contribution to the community. So it's a it's a hard one from my perspective. Jen, I see in the chat box a lot of agreement about the difficulties of growing and developing. And interestingly, especially in with uh, activity professionals, I was taught I actually have books about failure-free activities and was taught never, never to give a person living with dementia a challenge um, that, you know, they might not be able to accomplish. And I, I remember when I was conducting the research for this beautiful swirl in partnership with people living with dementia, one of my partners said, look, Jennifer, <laughs> it's my partner living with dementia. I want to do something real. And I mean, I mean, so real that 
if it doesn't go well, something bad will happen. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> oh, okay. Um, because I think there's a tendency to overprotect people with the best of intentions. I know I did. Um, but when we don't give people opportunities to experiment with new things, you know, to grow and develop, um, you know, when we try to make everything failure free, well, we're kind of removing a little bit of real life, aren't we? Absolutely. But you see freedom or um, seeking freedom, another big one. Huh? I do. And finding balance. And I would agree with that one, too, that um, helping people to to have some rest and active time during the day can be um, can be challenging as well. But I see almost everyone here. I'm not sure if I've seen having fun. So that must mean that we're in a um, the group of activities professionals. OK, well, we this one for a while, but we got a lot of good stuff to talk about. So let's move right. on. I love that. OK, so we're reframing dementia to really see it from both a biomedical and social relational perspective. Stop blaming all so-called behaviors on the dementia. Start looking at those as expressions of distress and unmet needs, then work proactively to support well-being so people's needs are met, and then they won't be in distress, or at least definitely not as much distress. The next pathway then is this idea of embracing complexity. Okay, and that's really all about communication, as we're going to hear. Um, we all know this. How many times have you heard someone say, if you've met one person living with dementia, you've only met one person living with dementia? We all say that. We all know that, that it's really complex and what works for one person may not work for another person. Back in 1990, when I graduated high school, I remember my first exposure to the work of Dr. Uh, Tom Kitwood, who is really one of the first people uh, to bring a person-centered approach to the field of dementia care and support. And Dr. Kitwood back in 1990 said, you know, dementia, the experience of living with dementia is modifiable because dementia is not just about the neurological impairment, but it's also about that person's health and their physical fitness, who they are, their biography, their life story. It's about their personality. And it's also about this, uh, the social psychological environment in which they find themselves. And these factors together create the experience of living with dementia, not just the dementia. Okay, And so dementia is complex. People are complex because every single human being is unique, right? So we know how complex it is to support a person living with dementia, let alone dozens or even hundreds, okay? But here's something we also know. This is common sense and it bears out in the research as well, that in complex situations, like raising a child is pretty complex, right? There's a lot of things that are complex, not simple, complex. Dementia support is complex. The two strongest tools we have our relationships and communication, okay? Not a fancy blueprint for success, not a super slick secret sauce formula, you know, for success that's gonna work in all cases with all people all the time. No, no, no. We know that's not true, okay? We're not baking cakes here. Um, we are supporting people living with dementia who are having a very complex experience and everybody's different relationships, strong relationships, deep knowing is critical to support a person living with dementia and really great communication with the person living with dementia, with the family care partners, and with the entire team. We have to stop looking for the one size fits all approach to supporting diverse people who are living with dementia. Now, let me give you just a quick practical example of how we can help strengthen relationships and improve communication in the context of residential dementia care and support. The old institutional model is very staff-centered, right? Interchangeable care partners, you know, there's really no dedicated assignments, you know, people move around, um, rotating staff. That is not helping us foster the strong relationships we need to support the complexity of dementia care and support. 
In that institutional model, we have this thing called shift reports. I've been in way too many to even count in my life, and most of them just put me to sleep. I feel disempowered in them. My voice isn't often heard in those shift reports. Somebody is just telling me what's up, but there, there's no involvement or open communication from anyone else on the team. Social relational perspective of dementia, embracing complexity means we got to do things different. In this model, and we have person-directed care instead of staff-centered staff care, and we support that because we have dedicated assignments. We've got the same care partners helping the same residents on the same neighborhood, day in and day out, fostering those relationships. And then instead of those top-down shift huddles, we have interdisciplinary, instead of top-down shift reports, excuse me, we have interdisciplinary shift huddles where collaborative decisions are made and everyone's perspective is gauged and valued. Dedicated assignments and shift huddles are great examples of supporting relationships and communication. At Carol Woods, it is part of what they do every day to support the complexity of dementia care and support without the benefit of a locked door. They use shift huddles every day to help focus on resident well being and ways to be proactive. They even have weekly neighborhood huddles to focus on the well being of everyone who lives, works, and visits that neighborhood. If you're looking for a nice resource, I put this in the slide deck. It's a free download from the Pioneer Network. It's a couple of years old, but um, really helps organizations implement daily shift huddles as part of their uh, resource engaging staff and individualizing care. And this is about how to create those dedicated assignments, how to implement those daily shift huddles, how to move that QI as close to the resident as possible, if not with the residents themselves. How do we ensure that we're engaging the people who work to support the residents the most closely as we're creating well-being plans? And what they found in piloting these resources that they freely share is homes that adopted this resource found a significant reductions in restraints, in alarms, in falls, and in the use of antipsychotics. So there might be a little something to strong relationships and effective communication. All right, Jen. All right, so we're gonna talk about risk next. So when we think about dementia inclusion, one of the biggest concerns that come up comes up is risk. So, um, so it's an important one to dive into. Um, and I want to be clear that as one that works in a provider organization who is dementia inclusive, um, it is something that brings me both anxiety and joy. Um, there are there's a there's a balance to strike here. And so if those are feelings that you are having right now too, then you're in good company. We're going to talk about how to negotiate through that a little bit at a couple of points in this time together. Um, it's also important to remember that experiencing the anxiety and joy of risk is also just part of being human. Um, and part of life, just like living with dementia is part of life for many folks as well. So um, on the next slide, you're gonna see two images. Um, and these are two different perceptions of risk. Um, when I think of risk, two phrases come to mind. One is risk benefit, um, which really implies that risk is all negative, And then there's benefit on the other side of the coin. Um, when in actuality, risk can lead to both a potential for harm as well as a potential for benefit. Um, going out for a walk could result in me falling and breaking my leg. It also could result in me enjoying a beautiful day outside um, or coming upon a friend that I haven't seen in a while. So there's, in taking those risks that we take every day, there's both possibility of benefit and harm. And if we get too focused on the harm piece of it, as we often do um, with my second phrase, safety first, um, then we're not necessarily thinking about all the possibilities that there are for a person. Safety first can often lead us to think of um, trying to create an environment that's completely without harm. And that then can lead into conversations that I've often been part of, of what if this happens? What if this happens? What if this happens? And those are all what if negatives. I and mean, we can they can become piled upon us and you can't even see your way out of it to think about how you might be able to look at both possibility for a negative side or a negative outcome 
with possibility for a positive outcome and really weigh the two equally, just like you see in the, um, the image on the right. So as we think about negotiating risk, um, to when we're supporting and partnering with people living with dementia, we want to be sure to weigh both the potential for harm with the potential for benefit. Um, you can think of these as upside and downside risk as well. The next slide walks us through some things to think about as we're negotiating risk. Um, you know, we think about the word negotiate, you're kind of trying to look at how can you really to the best extent possible meet various interests. And we have interests um, when we are supporting our residents and partnering with them to think about um, limiting the potential for harm, but also maximizing the potential for them to have good days and good moments. So it's kind of my, my mantra of more well-being and less distress applies here as well. Um, everything that we do every day has potential for both positive and negative outcomes. Um, and those can, we can be able to predict them and sometimes they're unpredictable as well. Um, and again, we're wanting to weigh both of those. And I love this question that's the final um, bullet here, asking what's the risk of doing it without also asking what's the risk of not doing it. Um, because the conversation often goes down the path of all the things that can happen and ditches people can fall into and strangers that can pick people up in the middle of the night and all kinds of terrifying things, but there's also lots of potential for good as well and things we consider to be risky. Um, so next I'd like for us to take a look at risk through um, just kind of our own personal lens. Risk is something that's really important um, to attach to our values. We all kind of have feelings about what we think is safe and not safe and risks we take for ourselves and um, risks that we might support others in taking some of us would go skydiving. Some of us, like myself, would not. Um, and so it's when we think about how we are partnering with residents living with dementia, it's important to think about that for ourselves as well. So here's a question that we'd love to hear from you in the chat box about. How does your approach to negotiating risk differ when supporting residents living with dementia compared to managing risks for yourself? Looking forward to it hearing what we have to say. I'm gonna pull up my chat here. I see, yeah, Diana is saying, have to admit, I worry about liability. And Diana, you are, are not a, alone. You know, I think about things that could go wrong. And if something goes wrong, am I gonna be liable? Yeah. That's where that anxiety I was talking about comes into play. Yeah, very human to think about it that way. Mm-hmm. We tend to think about personal responsibility when it's someone else, um, more so perhaps than ourselves. We're ready to deal with the consequences ourselves if we're not able to, if we don't predict it as well as we hoped. I love Elizabeth saying, risk equals trying new things. No risk could cause boredom, <laughs> stifling of exciting changes. Yeah, No That's risk. Imagine life without risk. Right? That having fun cup would sure be dry. Mm -hmm. Asking ourselves, will this work for them? That I think really points too to the, the importance of individualizing for the person. A risky situation will look very different for me than for Jennifer. And so we want to think about that. Yeah. Um, this is also a really important topic to partner with families um, and residents on as well and help to understand what their, their lenses are too. You know, Jen, I remember visiting a community and they had this beautiful courtyard and the um, doors were locked. And I said, oh, wow, you guys got this beautiful yard. How come the doors are locked? And they said, oh, well, we're kind of, we're afraid that the residents are going to go out there and they're going to fall. And, mm -hmm. um, and I said, well, so do the residents ever fall inside? <laughs> you know, <laughs> it, you know, like people are, might fall on um, anywhere and um, trying to protect against that then by locking doors is is really you know depriving people of their right to breathe fresh air and have sunshine on their face um but yeah it's it is this is a, a real concern right well i love that story and also makes me think of you know how many times have we all um come across something that we don't do in our communities because one time because one time somebody choked on a hot dog, so now we don't have hot dogs. Because one time somebody you know, tripped on that staircase, so now we've got a gate across it. 
Um, there's a lot of that. And, you know, and our regulations reflect that um, perspective as well. So, um, yeah, it's something for us to think about. And then also recognizing um, the challenges, too, that come from that that type of approach. Okay, Jennifer. And thanks everyone for your participation in the chat box. So uh, the next pathway we want to share with you is about creating an inclusive environments. So if we really want to help support dementia inclusion within residential care settings, we kind of have to look around to make sure that the physical and social environments are going to be conducive um, to supporting um, the diverse group of residents living with dementia differently. But there are some kind of rules of thumb, if you will, that we know are, are helpful. Um, first, we talk about the importance of creating smallness in the largeness, right? Think neighborhoods, neighborhood teams, think neighbors, fostering those relationships on a neighborhood, ensuring proper lighting, right? Very important. No dimly lit hallways so that, I'm sorry, but not just people living with dementia can navigate those hallways, but just older adults can navigate those hallways because older adults need more light to function as normal. Um, I think we all know by now to really look out for any glare, busy flooring patterns um, that can throw off um, the perceptual needs of a person living with dementia. Wayfinding, very helpful. Um, cues, whether they're sensory cues or visual cues, which I guess are also sensory, um, but having you know wayfinding strategies in the environment you know, really being aware of acoustics. Um, people living with dementia have a hard time filtering out um, so-called background noise. Um, there isn't background noise. Um, that that it's It just becomes forward noise and makes it difficult to communicate and understand. I love, I got this from Jen, this idea that, you know, we think we've shaped the environment, but we've got to be aware of each person's needs within that environment we're shaping. And we need some agility to be able to respond and reshape that environment for each individual's unique needs. Um, this one really gets me, please, please, please stop providing views of places that people cannot freely access. That seems like a cruel cruel torture. Um, and again, if you heard me in the first session, I, you know, I've done everything, um, any critiques that I'm sharing are things that I have also done um, wrong um, before I knew better. But to give people a vision of places that they are not allowed to go um, just fosters um, helplessness and dependency protect the right to freely access the outdoors. For many people, that is essential to proactively supporting their well-being. You know, think, how do I create that sense of belonging and self-determination so that people can self-direct and self uh, so have self-directed engagement in those environments and ensure privacy? Um, recently, I toured a memory care community in my state and all of the residents doors to their private apartments were all locked during the day. And I said, well, wow, what's going on here? And they said, oh, well, you know, we're afraid people are going to go in and take other people's things. And so we just lock everyone out of the rooms during the day. And then when it's time for bed, then they could go back in there. That is a massive invasion of that person's need for privacy and their need to have a zone of control that is theirs and to be surrounded by familiar objects. So we have to really look for ways to support privacy as well as community. Um, in the slide deck, you'll see a great free downloadable resource called Supporting Comfort and Belonging for People Living with Dementia, a, team, a guide for team members to enhance the environment in senior living. Really wonderful guide written by Dr. Al Power um, and his colleague up at the Research Institute for Aging. Um, and so just know that that's there. And I'd really encourage you to take a look. Another great resource that I found that helps us, you know, move from the photo on the top to the photo on the bottom is uh, some really wonderful resources by CareFit for VIPS. These are all free resources, folks. And I snag this per personal possessions assessment uh, directly from uh, that website. This is the work of Dr. Don Brooker and colleagues. Um, they're doing really wonderful work so that we can look at how to create inclusive environments for human beings. So just wanted you to know about those. Okay, Jen. 
All right, let's talk about technology. Uh, this is one that I'm excited about. It's one that I'm constantly learning. And um, even after, so I've been at Carowinds for 16 years and um, really especially involved in our journey of dementia inclusion for the last 10 or so. And um, technology has really come a long way, even just in the last few years, um, where there are more options out there that we can use and even tailor to the person um, in order to, to help them to have more good days and good, mo uh, good moments. Um, I think that there's particularly possibilities with technology to think about how to streamline the non-human element of work for our team members so that then that frees us up as team members to really spend more time engaging with residents. Um, so on the next slide are some, some ways of thinking about technology, possible uses. Um, I'm gonna be upfront that I'm not somebody who's coming here with a lot of technology and able to, to walk you through all the different um, tools that are out there. Um, but at the same time, um, I'm glad to, to be able to offer perhaps some examples that we use at Kara Woods and talk about different um, possibilities for working with technology. Um, supporting independence and engagement. Um, you know, our sponsor, Life Loop, has it's never too late. And um, that's something that we use at Carroll Woods. Um, and many communities around use that as well. And there are more and more um, technologies out there that are really, really that are really um, intended to support engagement. More and more smart technologies for supporting independence. Um, and that really is something that can support residents across the continuum of support. I'm thinking particularly of residents living in more of an independent living setting um, can help someone to really maintain that home and that living arrangement for longer because we've got more opportunities for support um, for reminders or medication support or you know, even um, a check-in to make sure folks are doing okay on a daily basis. You can also simplify communication. There's portals out there, um, really help to strengthen partnership among family and professional care partners. Um, and then just kind of, you know, again, to reiterate that general statement of let's think about what we can do to really help us to focus on interaction, human interaction, um, and use technology for, um, I particularly think about it in terms of documentation, and um, and communication. How can we have symptom or systems that really support staff to document efficiently, so that there's not a lot of um, a lot of time spent trying to work through some of these systems, um, and that can create a supportive environment. Even the um, hearing aids that now um, you can use to to be able to find your hearing aid very easily. You can ping it kind of like you can ping your phone. Um, helps people to find hearing aids, which go missing all the time, seemingly grow legs and walk around. Um, and then a person can remain connected to their environment in that way. Um, you know, I just am, I am curious about what the future holds with technology. Um, and I tend to think of it from a place of optimism and what we might be able to achieve with it. Um, but that with the caveat of you know, we really, we want to think ethically about this as well and the potential for um, overreaching and perhaps um, thinking about how we might, we might decide we want this technology for this person, perhaps skip over that important step of consent. So I always want to consider consent, particularly if we're thinking about something that's a GPS or something that's monitoring a person's location um, and also the implications for privacy too. So um, the respectfully part is a really important um, aspect to remember as we think about how we might test out some of these, these new technologies and think about what we use going forward. Okay, next is just a recap. We've, we've made it through our six positive pathways. Um, and to recap those, we have reframe dementia, focusing on well-being, really understanding how complex um, dementia really is and embracing that rather than getting overwhelmed by it, considering both upsides and downsides to risk um, and the humanity that comes from that, not just thinking about the person, but the environment that they live in, um, and then being curious about technology um, and considering its ethics as we move forward. So now we're going to visit Carol Woods for a little bit. Um, this is where I am right now. 
And um, Carol Woods is a community of about 600 plus older adults. Um, we're in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Um, there you can see our campus. Um, we are set on 120 acres. We're a very nature-oriented community. Um, folks often talk about coming here for community and for the supports as they experience changes of aging and then for the beautiful grounds as well. Um, you'll often see folks walking on the trails. Um, for many, it's a daily endeavor, especially on a beautiful day like today. And um, is a a place that really has embraced dementia inclusion since we opened in 1979. Um, in the early 90s, Carol Woods chose to eliminate restraint use. Um, and that was really something that happened when um, Pat Sprague, who so recently retired CEO, came to the community and then saw restraints as, um, or as saw, um, segregated and locked memory care units as being an extension of restraints, kind of an environmental restraint, so to speak. And so did not follow the trend of opening a memory care area and instead um, tried to think of other ways, other pathways, you might say, to, um, to some of the challenges of living um, together side by side as a community of diverse cognitive abilities, ensuring that residents continue to have a sense of belonging um, and that sense of belonging that really brought them to Carol Woods. Rather than having a diagnosis and being separated from what they've come to have as the, um, the fullness of their days, being able to remain um, connected um, just with some support around them. So we have four levels of support, early acceptance, which is folks who live off campus and have access to some of the amenities, and then the more typical independent living, assisted living, and skilled nursing. And residents live in the level of support that best meets the whole picture of their needs. So we think about it from a person-centered standpoint, really focusing how we can um, best support a person's well-being needs. Um, so when we think about our approach at Carol Woods, um, when we tend to use the word upstream, we talk about our upstream um, Approach. And that comes from some work that we did with Jennifer. Um, we, we partnered with Jennifer to perform a participatory action research project, really brought together various stakeholders from the Carol Woods community and um, embarked on this because while we were dementia inclusive, we were really feeling like we were getting caught up in the challenges and we needed some tools and we were really trying to rescue every situation um, and were what we have come to call downstream at that point in time. Um, and so we have this project we call the Quest Upstream, and it's called a Quest because it's a worthy endeavor, and that came from a dining team member. Um, and Upstream really refers to trying to get to the source of a person's distress and um, work to have a focus on well being. So, again, that more well being, less distress. So as an outgrowth of that, that was in 2018 and 2019. Um, we've had a pandemic since, um, and are continuing to work on these pathways. And I think one of the keys for us is really in how we frame and how we view dementia. So this goes to that pathway of reframing dementia. And how I really like to think about this is on this slide here of, First, it's making a switch from saying things and having certainty about a situation and really asking and trying to understand the situation. So, for example, instead of saying that a resident is disruptive, combative, or acting out and essentially labeling that person as a problem, we recognize that this is a basic, oh, I'm going to forget, BPS, basic personal sign of distress. distress. <laughs> Um, that's classic for me to do something like that um, and try to understand what that um, what that action or communication is really trying to communicate. What is that person's unmet need? You can also think about it. What is it? The, what is the environment doing that's causing this kind of distress, et cetera? Um, we also shifted from thinking this and this is one we were big on. This resident needs more life enrichment, more therapies or companions. So we would have these, you know, we're necessarily doses like medications, but we had these interventions. This is what this person needs. If this person were in these activities, they wouldn't have this distress. Well, and sometimes it was that a person needed more fun in their life or do something they enjoyed or where they're feeling like they're making a difference. 
But sometimes it was really that they needed a sense of connection to a new environment. Life enrichment is not itself going to be able to take care of that. Um, so instead of thinking in that way, we thought more about how can we fill this person's cups of well-being, ensuring that meaningful engagement is part of that, that connection is part of that, that therapy of appropriate is part of that, um, but it, that it's not everything. And we're really pulling back and looking at that whole framework that helps us, I kind of think of it as getting to all the corners of a person's being. Um, it's helpful to have almost like a a list or a set that you are looking at to ensure you've considered every aspect of who a person is. And um, this is how this actually works. This is what it looks like. Um, we would think it'd be a nice clean arrow and it's not. It's this, it's two steps forward, one step back. It is absolutely 100% complex. And, um, and then the next slide talks about navigating challenges um, and you know, we we use a lot of education, baseline education with residents and staff so that we understand what dementia is and where certain actions might come from and how to positively interact with people who are living with cognitive change. And that really helps to breed empathy among all of us. It helps residents to understand why a person might come into their room unexpectedly um, it helps us as team members to know how to how to relate and how our interactions can help to minimize distress. So that's very foundational. Um, the huddles that Jennifer mentioned, um, we we have those huddles weekly on neighborhoods to build team well-being, and then we also do shift huddle as well. So that we're really looking at based on what the team members bring forward, who's having bad days or bad moments, and then talk about how we can best support that person's well-being. We also um, pull well-being plans where we actually evaluate the cups for each resident and think about what cup we might want to fill and how we might fill that cup as a team um, and have a plan that we use for that. Communication with families is really important. Um, I can give you an example here. We had a resident who moved from assisted living to um, skilled nursing and she'd been content in assisted living, but her needs had increased moved to skilled nursing and um, thought that someone was after her constantly. And it was the hardest thing to see. She was in a lot of distress. And it was because she didn't feel connected to her new environment. Um, she was someone who had a lot of things around her and her things had not all moved with her. Um, her daughter had seen it as an opportunity to clean things up and get tidy. And um, and so we really had to partner with her daughter to um, to talk about how to create an environment that the resident could connect with in addition to us as team members too, thinking about ways to, um, to help that person to be connected. Um, I'm doing a, a time check here. I feel like there's a lot more to cover. So I'm going to quickly talk about safe walking because I know that that's a big one. Um, and then maybe we'll have a moment for a question. Um, but I apologize for the speed. So we have a pretty extensive system that we use at Carol Woods to support residents in walking safely around campus. Um, it is both human as well as technology. We use something called the watch list that lists the residents who might walk out of an area we call a safe zone um, and be in a place where they wouldn't be able to get um, home easily on their own. All staff know that if they encounter one of these residents, their primary responsibility right then is to engage with that resident um, and to communicate with other staff through a communication system that we have. It's, um, it's also something we emphasize, that's your top priority. You're not gonna get in trouble for being late to a meeting or doing something else, you know, writing up because of this, this is your top priority. And, um, and of course, always talking about why this is important to us and its connection to our philosophy. We do also use some location tracking devices. Um, we have silent door alarms that we've put in place. We have a, a system of cameras too, so we can sometimes the um, our 24-7 communications desk can be watching somebody on camera and then they don't necessarily need to have a person who's um, got eyes on them, closer to them on the ground. Um, and then as a last resort, we have a missing person procedure that we would use if indeed um, someone was missing or we would split up as staff to search the campus. Um, I'm going to pause there. I see Charles joining us and Jennifer and I just had so much to as typical.
Yes. Well, thank you. We'll, um, we will, uh, you know, we've got the chat box, which is great. And I'm hanging out. If um, you do have questions, I'll do my best to respond um, via chat. I've been reading your comments. Um, I think uh, my, our hope is that after this session, you might pick one of these pathways um, and just, you know, work together as a community to discuss how to strengthen it. Um, and again, this is what Carol Woods focuses on. It is what enables them to be dementia inclusive, is caring about these pathways. And then the next session, what you're going to hear are some exemplars of dementia inclusion. Uh, this is a facilitated uh, panel discussion with provider communities who used to have locked and segregated memory care and then made that decision to open their doors and an opportunity for you to ask them what specific actions have they taken to support dementia inclusion. Very practical and inspiring session coming up. And so uh, here's our contact info. But again, um, Thank you so much for having us, Charles. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity to share and, and we'll keep an eye on the chat box too. Thank, thank you all. Thank you so much, Jen. It was lovely to see you. Thank you so much for the great education.